That looks good. That's recording now. Right. Got the wee red dot. Okay. Is that you? Yes. Yeah. Good to go? Yeah. Good. And I'll come and sit in. Right. You can edit the top part anyway. Oh. <coughs> Technically, that's looking good, so we're, we're ready to start. And I'll put microphones on the phone. Right. Right, on you go. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to our new video. I'm delighted to be joined by the one and only Pat Nevin. Nice to meet Sam, you. Nice to meet you. Um, so, yeah, let's go. So, Pat, what were you like growing up as a little kid? Do you know what? I was very earnest. I was very serious when I was a wee kid. Um, I loved playing football. But my family, I've got a big family. You know, I've got... Uh, Three brothers, two sisters, my mum and dad, and we lived in a rough part of the East End of Glasgow. Um, but we were very serious minded. We liked to laugh, but we were dead honest. And we were into if anyone ever did anything wrong in our family, it was really friendly. But nobody ever swore in our family. Ever. Never, never happened. Um, but we were really happy. And a lot of people look back and when you're young and they say, oh, that terrible rough part of Glasgow you lived in, it must be a tough life. But you don't know any better. You just live a normal life. Um, and I love school. Uh, I was lucky I was the top of the class at most things that I did. So, you know, we're, my family, particularly my dad, wanted the education. My mum was big in that as well. But my dad taught me how to play football as well. And he'd been a, a good sportsman. He was a bo decent boxer. But he also took the school teams and he took the boys clubs and all the rest of it. So, right from an early age, he'd be out training me from about five years of age. Every, every day after he came back for work, I'd be out there for an hour with my dad, training and skills, and he'd learned. He'd read all the coaching manuals and all the rest of it, so because he'd read all that, he knew what to do. And he used to get into Celtic. My family are big Celtic fans, and I was in those days as well. And he'd go down and watch Jock Steen, train the players, and he was he was the best manager well, I've ever known by a long time. He was even Hibs manager. That shows you how good he was. Um, but he's, So my dad learned all that, and he taught me uh, I watched football at that age, but I didn't do it because I wanted to be a professional footballer. I just did it because I liked playing football. That was it. I had more. At no point in my life did I ever think, I want to be a footballer. And I know it sounds really weird, but I just liked doing it. So it's a very funny to be like that when you're a youngster, because a lot of other, you, talk, you look at kids now and you hear the young lads that make it in the game. They always say the same things, that's all I ever wanted to do. Well, I was the opposite. In fact, the good line for me is, I tried really hard not to be a footballer and failed. <laughs> That's it's a weird one. It's a weird, you get weird answers from me. I'll tell you that. You get weird answers from me. But they're just the way it was. But now, obviously, you're a Hibs fan. Yeah, that was a long and complicated one. Um, and my change happened again, maybe 20 years ago now. Um, and my son was getting to an age where he was getting into football. And I'd gone through all the stuff, and you know, the Celtic Rangers stuff, all the, the stuff that involved with the sectarian bit that's the nasty bit, the bit I don't like. Yeah. And I just didn't want my family to be involved in that, because they're not like that. And my family, even though they were Celtic fans, they weren't into all that sort of stuff. Um, so I just thought, Hibs were always my second team and Celtic my first team, so I switched it. And, uh, you know, I didn't even need to buy a new jumper. <laughs> <laughs> well, that saved your money. <laughs> Uh, what was your first football memory of wanting to play football professionally? Well, I kind of answered that there wasn't. I, yeah. never, I, never, I never did. Um, but there was a wee chance early on because I signed as an S form for Celtic. Right. And every, all my mates all thought, um, some of everybody around me thought, oh, well, he's going to make it. But I didn't agree. And I was just like the idea of playing. And I, I never told any of my mates I was an S form. Celtic and considering the east end of Glasgow and the school I went to if that, was, that would have been amazing like wow you sing for Celtic I didn't tell anybody because I wanted to keep the two different parts of my life together, apart for a lot of people it sounds strange that for me it didn't it? because I wanted if somebody liked me I wanted them to like me for me not for what I did you know and I, 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 see, I told you I was dead serious when I was young <laughs> <laughs> so that's what my kind of attitude was at the time. So I, I'll be honest with you, I was playing professionally and I still didn't think I wanted to be a footballer because I was doing part-time professionally right at the start. 
when I left Celtic and I ended up coming back into it. But I was playing part-time and, and doing a degree as well in Glasgow. So it was weird that I was a pro and it still had me, made me think I'm dying to be a pro. But it, I'll tell you one thing though. I was playing at the Clyde Brist point. I was training two nights a week with a team. I was doing my own training as well because I love training and love running. Um, and I was just going to do the normal degree stuff. So I was living a normal life. I just happened to be kicking the ball. Um, but I love doing it. And this is a bit that's hard to understand. You can love doing it without wanting all the other stuff. I've never fancied the fame. I never fancied the, you know, people looking at you all the time. I just didn't fancy it. Um, but it certainly comes with the territory. And that's why I didn't even like it. That's just a great question. That's why I was worried about it because... I didn't want it to make me any different for the person I was. And I'd watched enough people become famous, be footballers, musicians, or whatever, and get a wee bit free of themselves and pleased with themselves. And I didn't want to be like that. I just wanted to be a normal bloke. Um, and then I've, I figured out that, do you know what? Even if you're doing it professionally, it's all right to be a normal bloke. Now, that, there's plenty out there that are doing it. So did I want to be a professional when was the first moment? I probably when I was I'd been playing football for about ten years I thought I suppose I'd be a professional footballer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's a weird answer I know I know. Best club you've played at? Uh play for or played at? Best club you've played at. At? Um Do you know the world they're all great in their own ways, I have to say. The happiness I had at Clyde because I was do, doing normal life was brilliant. When I went to Chelsea, I mean, I played a year at Chelsea twice, and the fans down there are still brilliant with me. And they all still would say, you know, talk about me as one of their favourite players. And it's a long time ago, so that was a brilliant club for me. But I had great times with, with each club that I went to. Um, can I change the question to, where was the happiest? Aye, this is a on, maybe a on, bit you, on you go. I actually think, and this is going to surpri it would surprise you maybe, right at the end of my play career, I had a year at Kilmarnock. And I had an absolute ball there. And the reason why, a decent team would come in and third in the league. Kill the pines. Well, the kill the pines, we weren't allowed to eat them. We had to get ourselves fit. And I was getting a wee bit older by that point, so I had to take care of the tummy. Um, but in reality, it's because of the mates. The guys I was playing with. I've got more mates for that year at Kelly than all my other clubs. It was only one year, and it's a couple of reasons for it. I was back home. I'd spent most of my career in England and I'd finally come back home. Um, and I was with Scottish people who had the same sense of humour as me. And these guys like Gary Holt was a great lad. Dylan Kerr was there, who's brilliant lad, although he's not Scottish, but he's kind of he's kind of one of us. Um, but just a great, to be. Yeah, yeah, it's just a great bunch of lads. And the manager uh, was Bobby Williamson, who went on to the Hybies. Uh, Bobby was just, he was like me, and that he came face to us as well. So and a younger he, version? Yeah, he, I think he was slightly older than me. But he was um, very different from me, style-wise and what he was into. But we, we got each other. And that's one of the best things. See, if you play for a football club, as long as you and the manager and coach, they understand you, they know what you're trying to do, they rate you, you rate them. That's so important. Definitely. Favourite game you've played in throughout your career? Um, every club's got a game that he jumps out to. I remember playing one at, for Clyde at Alloa and we, I scored the best goal I ever scored. Um, I remember playing for Chelsea where the game, we, we didn't like Sheffield Wednesday at the time. We had a real problem with him. I know it sounds odd now, but that was a big team. We were playing against right at the start. And we were fighting with him all the time. There was one game, and a cup game away from home, where we were 3-0 down at half-time. And we ended up getting 4-4. Um, and took them down to Stamford Bridge, and we beat them there. In those two games, any Chelsea fans that talk about it, talk about those two games, that were amazing. The atmosphere was great. Two different styles. We were a skillful team. They were a big hoof them, kind of chase it, big lumps kind of team. And we didn't like each other. Um, and that was a brilliant one. So the 4-4 there, was amazing. If you ever see a game, it's 4-4. But then I played in a 4-4 for, for um, Everton against Liverpool. And that was a brilliant, famous game. You can still get that on YouTube. And it was the players they had, like John Barnes and Ian Rush. And they, they were amazing, amazing players. But 
there's always games that stick out in, in every team you play for. Um, the Scotland one that sticks out, uh, I played in a game up at um, t uh, Aberdeen and we, we beat Estonia 3-1. Now that doesn't sound great, but I was allowed to play in my own position that day for Scotland. Because usually I played in the wing and I'm, I'd never played in the wing before I became a pro. I'd always been a striker or a 10. But they let me play up front and I scored two and made the other one. And I thought to myself, yeah, I might get a few more games up front for Scotland. Problem is, we'd have held a lot of good strikers then. <laughs> they just thought of me as a winger. So I get stuffed out in the wing again after that. But that game, and the fact that the, the goal that I made, I made it for my best mate, Brian McClare. So when you play a game of football and your mates are around you, and John Collins was playing, he was a great friend, um, Paul McStay, brilliant guy, uh, Tam um, Boyd, just the, the people around me were people are hated. And right at that point in time, it looked as if they were going to buy me at Celtic right after it as well. So that game was a lot happening. So there's lots of games you remember. I'll tell you what, you remember some of the bad ones too. <laughs> I think you, you sort of remember more bad than good That's sometimes. That's true, you do sometimes. You have, you have told you two games and both of them were draws. <laughs> we weren't We ended up winning the replays in the two, four, four games. But um, they stick in your memory a bit. And to be honest, Fans of those teams always talk to you about them, so games that I played in, certainly those jump out a wee bit. They can't even be that bad then. Yeah, can't be that bad. Best manager you've played under? Nah, that's a good question. Um, well, I first had a wee bit of time with Jockstein, and he was genius. He was the best ever. And I worked under Sir Alec Ferguson for a wee while. And apparently he was quite good. Um, but for, that was with Scotland. But in reality, it's the guys you work with week in, week out. Craig Brown was my manager at Clyde, and Craig went on to be Scotland manager. And in hindsight, when we look at what he'd done, he'd done a great job, so he was a good manager. I suspect the two that I liked best were a guy called John Neal, who was a Chelsea manager. And he used to do a, he used to do a thing before the games. Now I was a wee skinny wee lad for Glasgow, and nobody expected me to get in the team. I was only 19. He used to do sort of these big pros all around, the, and they'd do all the stuff before the game, tell everybody their positions. And they'd come at the end of the team talk and they'd say, and if you give the ball to Pat, you'll win. And I'm like, what? Me? Me? <laughs> and I loved the fact that he believed in me. And uh, the players, he could have fallen out of me for that, but they didn't. They, they came out, all right, all right. And he just thought that I could create, you know, and well, by the time when I went to Everton after that, there was a guy called Colin Harvey, just the most brilliant bloke. And he was a good coach. And he was very unlucky because we were a very good team a terrible atmosphere in the, in the camp. You know, two cliques, or three actually. He once said to me, he once said in the dressing room one day, he goes, it's not a problem with this club. There's two cliques. There's the new guys that are trying to do something, and there's the old guys who won't work with them. And then he stopped and he went, actually there's three cliques, there's part as well. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't take part in any of that. So you got the point or not? Um, I think he, what he was saying is, you shouldn't be in cliques, you should be the way part is. Work every, just work with everybody yeah. um, and I liked him for that and I liked him for the fact that he rated my style he liked and I was playing in England at the time and I didn't like the style of English football at the time it was, it was big it was rough it was big players that would lump the ball in the middle all that sort of stuff whereas now now if you look at Man City and all the rest of it Liverpool even Chelsea so to some degree they're playing really nice technical football which was more my style but in England at the time, there weren't, any, there weren't many teams playing like that. And uh, those two managers wanted to play that, that way that I liked. You can ask for much more yeah. than that. It's like, Hibs Hib fans understand this, by the way. That, see if you win. That's what I loved about Hibs when I started to go to see Hibs. See if you win. And it wasn't a good style. It was a bit, it was all right. But see if you even drew, but you played well. The fans loved it. The fans liked it. Because they love good football. And being brought up in that, I mean, my memories of Hibs teams go back to the 70s and Pat Stanton, and Brown, Black, Black Shade Lord, all them. Oh, great players. Brownlee, what a player he was. But they were good footballers. And that's what you're, you're brought up in. You want to see good football too. And that's, I want to play because I want to play good football and be entertaining. Oh well. Cash for much more mm -hmm. than that. Best advice you've been given? Ooh, that's very, uh, very good. Do you know what? 
forget all the football people, forget all the managers, forget all that. My mum. No. <laughs> she said to me once, uh, I was very young. But you're getting old. No, I was getting old, but I was only 10 when she said this to me. Because <laughs> I was playing football and everybody was looking at it. And I was going, oh, I, I, well, people will think of me. And she goes, nobody's looking at you. Everybody's only concerned about themselves most of the time. Don't worry about what people think about you. They don't know you. And I'm like, do you know what? I stuck with me my whole life. And that's helped not only in football, because you'll make a backside of it sometimes when you're playing football. Don't worry about it. Just go home with it and do something else. People worry too much about other people think about them. And see if you put it, bring it to the present day. In the present day, people worry about what people say to them online and social media and all that. I couldn't give a stuff. They're jealous about themselves more than anything. They, they may be, but I don't care. No, <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, I really don't care. If I've done something wrong, I'm more worried about what I think of myself. <laughs> not what other people think of me. So, I understand why it upsets a lot of people and social media is a strong thing, particularly for youngsters. But I wish I could give them that experience of saying, see if anybody, because if you're in the public eye at all, you get, you get stuck, you get abuse on social media. But, if only they knew I was laughing at them. <laughs> I'm <laughs> laughing at, and by the way, I'm laughing at them, but I'm laughing at me more than anything else because I don't take myself seriously now. I was very honest when I was young, but as I say, that piece of advice that you're talking about, my mum my, my taught me. And that was a great piece of advice. That's brilliant. What goals would you like to achieve? I never had goals. Again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, like, I didn't want to win a World Cup, I didn't want to win a year. It was a, if I played for Scotland, that was great, you know. My goal was to be happy. That's it. Nothing more. Happiness. If I can maximise my potential, do as well as I can with what skills I've got. But nothing beats happiness. So, you know, people say, what's your goals? Well, I want to be happily married to a lovely girl. I am. We've been married for years and we're sitting here in Kelso. I get married a mile away from where we are sitting right now. <laughs> a mile away. I was living in England, but my, my girlfriend, or wife to be at the time, she came from Coast Street. We are in Kelso just now, and we get married at a church in Kelso, so I've got good memories coming back here. And uh, I mean, those, these first 32 years have been hard. <laughs> I bet she says that to you, Dave. Yeah, they're harder for her. <laughs> what inspires you? Sorry, sorry. Who inspires Who inspires me? Um, unusual people. Um, there's people that are good at things, but it's, they're not showy, showy. I'm not very good with the modern. One of my things I hate most, see if a player scores a goal and then points to his back. So you look at my name. I can't be doing that. It's I, like, I, well, we already know your look, name. Look at me, kind of thing. Now we can see you, it's all right. Um, people that do something, and you know they're doing it for the team. You know they're doing it for the group. They're doing it for your entertainment. Um, there's a guy called Humphrey Littleton who used to do a radio show called Sorry, I Haven't a Clue. And because uh, I've been working in telly and radio for many years now, he, they never knew where he lived. Nobody knew. He never sold himself. He was just good at what he did. So they had to get a hold of him. They had, they had a letter. They'd send him a letter. And then he'd come in and do the show and then go away again. They knew nothing about him. He was a great jazz musician, but he didn't take part in anything else unless it was suiting him. So I look at people that are very good at what they do and they're not selling themselves. So would I be a Messi or a Ronaldo fan? I'd be a Messi fan. You know, if I look at my favourite players, I look at someone like David Silva. It wouldn't be the guy who's, look at me, it's a guy that's working hard and been talented and just quietly getting on with the game. So that's the people that inspire me. Good answer. What goals would you like to what goals would you like to achieve? Well, I've kind of said that really. Yeah. But um, there's nothing professionally I want to achieve. Obviously uh, no no. I, I, if I'm going to stay local, uh, about seven or eight miles along the road is Coldstream Golf Club and I would like to get a 75 <laughs> Coldstream Golf Club and if we're going along the road to the Roxburgh Golf Club which is no far away from here 
I would like to, I would like to beat 80 there. I've got really into golf and I've got all that, and I, I love it, I love playing it. It's seen by people down south of the posh guys game. Scotland didn't like that. It's a, it's a kind of working man's game. And uh, I love my golf and I love playing it. Um, so I'm getting close to those. I'm getting close to it. I'm, getting, I'm actually, weirdly, when you get older, you're, not, you're supposed to get worse at golf. I just keep getting better at golf. So that's what I'd like to do. <laughs> you should play my dad at golf. Yeah. Is he good? I oh, enjoy it. Doesn't matter if you're good or not. That's a great. He's thing. all right. He's getting um. Well, that's the thing is you don't you don't need to be <laughs> good. You can play with anybody because of the handicap system. You know, he gets ten shots or I get five shots. You can play with anybody. The guy I play with, um, Martin, who was a doctor along the road, um, play with him all the time. And you know, he's he's not he's not as good a player as I am. But for a while, he was getting a stroke a hole, and it made a good game. You can enjoy it. So that's that's one of the joys of golf. Just and also, if you have a bad game, yeah, it doesn't matter. You may have a good one the next day. I never get angry with it. But you go to the pub after. I can never. Go, you know, I'm not very good at pubs. I'm not. You know, I don't. I've never had a beer in my life. That's, yeah. a, that's a secret, right? I've never had a beer in my life, right? All right. But before you were too surprised, I drink whiskey and wine like a fish. <laughs> The bit to what they say. Yeah, no, I, it's the, I, 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 I'm always driving, so I never drink when I'm out. But I have a glass of wine when I go home, so I never go to the pub, really. I'm, I'm not a big puppy. No, that's fair enough. Funniest player you've played with throughout your career? Um, I loved just being in the company. I, I get Duncan, Duncan Ferguson was funny. He had no idea he was funny. But he was hilarious. He used to do things that were so mad. Um, and I've got lots of stories. I wrote a book recently uh, about the early part of my life. And there's about four different stories about Big Duncan in, in the book. And they're all brilliant. And I could have, I could have written 20 stories about Big Duncan. Um, and he didn't even know he was funny. Because he just, he was a normal guy who happened to be playing football who was a bit mad. Just the strangest thing about, the maddest thing about Duncan now, he is Captain Sensible now. You meet him now and he's the most sensible guy in the world. And I'm thinking, every time I see him I think, great to see you big man, but who are you? And what have you done with Duncan Ferguson? Because <laughs> you've gone. <laughs> um, but he was great fun. Uh, but every, every team's got a, a, a funny guy in it. Uh, I have to say, my time with Scotland, it was really weird because I was a Celtic supporter then. And the other Celtic guys were my mates, like Nick Stay and all that, and Chalky and all that. But the funny guys were the Rangers guys, like Coyste, you know, <laughs> and they were, they were dead funny, and they were always a laugh to be with. But I mean, Coyste would have tried to be funny. Ah, oh, no, he's, he's a good lad. I have to say, I, I, I struggle to say a bad, too many bad words about Coyste. Funny guy. Do you know he does something, though? He does something very clever, what very few people do. He acts, daft, he acts dafter than he is. He's actually very, very intelligent. He's one of them guys that you think he's just a bit daft. No, he's not. He's really, really clever. And that's a that's a clever thing to do. Most of us try to act cleverer than we are. The really clever people act dafter than they are. <laughs> Which is an unusual thing, isn't it? But it's still with Coisty, though. Yeah, I know. He's a, no, he's, a, he's honestly, you are not spend time with Coisty without laughing. If you come in this room just now, you'd have your laughing in t- 10 minutes. Honestly, it's a good And then I'll just say three, two hymns. There's no wrong with that. See, I did, here's an odd, odd thing where we're talking about that. I actually don't. I know you've got a famous quote after your illness. <laughs> I actually don't hate any teams. I don't do that. We, we, my family, we always, we support the teams because we like them, not because we dislike the others. No. And we were like that. That's what we were like. So we weren't, we weren't hating Rangers when we liked Celtic. You know, we don't, I don't hate England because I support Scotland. I mean, we don't do that. We don't hate Hearts. Because I support Hibs. I'll be honest with you, the Jambos fans have generally been brilliant with me. They've been different, especially when I was on the sports scene. Get a wee bit of grief, but to be honest, they've been as good as gold. It's the same as when my story got out there. Well, a few nasty comments, but majority of them just... You can't you can't react to... See if you get five people saying something nasty online. I don't know. There's, there's probably 10,000 people thinking good things. Oh, you know, I... that you've battled. Yeah. Exactly, but nah, I've got good mates that are hard fans. Exactly, exactly. 
best trainer you've seen throughout your career? I'll be very quick with that one, John Collins. John <laughs> Collins is class. <laughs> I would hope to be nearly as good as him, and I was a very good trainer. And I used to do all sorts of extra training afterwards, and I used to go distance running. I still do. I was running yesterday. Uh, I love running, and I'm very fortunate I can still run. And I know I'm lucky, because I've got two metal hips, but I can still run. Metal? Yeah. Two, I had to get two hip replacements. Yeah, that's what happens. Hip, hip, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to use that. I'm going to steal that from you. <laughs> so that's a quick answer to that one. Worst trainer. Oh, millions of honest to God. There was a guy called Bakesy Baker. He used to play for Kelly. He's very old. He just didn't like play. He didn't like train. Just, I mean, even playing was a bit of hassle for him. But he was a good player. Um, when I was at Everton, Tony Cotty. Not interested. Didn't like train. And there's lots of people like that. Famously, Aiden Hazard apparently is a terrible trainer. Um, but if you're good enough and you're doing the business, the thing is, see if you're not a good trainer in football, it'll catch you in the end. It will catch you. Because we all got older. And see if you've not been a tra good trainer and suddenly you get to 30, and there's a wee guy at 20 who's fitter than you. Doesn't need to be as good as you. He's fitter than you, and that'll stop you. So uh, there's been a few, a few ones that haven't been good tra trainers. Most of them, don't, they don't last. No. Who's your football and idols? I didn't do idols when I was a kid. Um, my football, my idols were. I love John Peel. He was a radio DJ. He was my hero. I like musicians. I was always a big fan of bands and things like that. When I was, I suppose Celtic at the time had, uh, you know, the old Lisbon Lions, but. People like Jimmy Johnson and Barry Old and all that. But coming through was Kenny Dalglish and David Hay and Danny McRae and they were great players. But the first strip that I owned was the number four hip strip. Because Pat Stanton was one of my favourite players. Even though in those days I wasn't a Hibs fan, they were my second team. But I was only a kid. I was like 10 or something. But I loved Pat Stanton. Um, but I wouldn't say heroes. I, I got to meet Pelly and got to become friendly with Pelly. And he's a brilliant bloke. And he's also one of the greatest ever footballers that ever lived. Many would say the greatest. So uh, I, I don't. I'm not mad at the word hero, but I definitely admire them. Ah. What is it like being a pundit? Or what was it like? I, mean, I still do it. I still do it. You know, three times a week on radio, um, the wee bit TV now and again. I have a very unusual outlook and. Um, I think there's, there's different types of pundits. Um, a lot of the time, there's some people that you need to say something extreme so it gets a reaction and you get an argument. And there are certainly some shows and some stations that you want a big argument and you want people to say extreme things. Um, I never ever done that at any point in my life. All I ever did was try give information. Um, very specifically, the wording here is important. Tell the listener something you might not know. Not that you don't know, because that would be arrogant. You might not know. So, give you an insight, technically. Um, see all the other sides of it. See the kind of slaughtering people and all the rest of it. Yeah. You can't help, you can't help being a bad player. It's not your fault. You're doing your best. So, if somebody does something wrong, I'll say, like, we got that wrong, and you should have done that. But I won't be hammering them. You know, I'll just be saying, this is what, and maybe for television, that style, my style is not really right. I'm more suited to radio because I'm talking to, I'm not trying to get clicks, I'm not trying to get social media mayhem going on, I'm just trying to talk to you. Do you know what I've always done? I talk to football fans like they've got a brain. That's what I try and do. I don't try and manipulate you, I don't try and wind you up, I don't do any of that. You talk to you and say, like, you know what you're talking about, you know your football. I'll talk to you at your level. Um, so that's, when I was able to do that and, and had done it for many, many years, I've done it for 25 years. And worked for Channel 5 for many years, did a wee bit in BBC Scotland for a few years. I've worked for a lot of Irish companies, i work for a couple of international ones now. Um, and that's all I'll keep on doing. Trying and, and there's a, a, a saying in the BBC, it's called inform, educate, and entertain. That's what the BBC is supposed to be for. 
I try to do it in that order. You entertain. That's it? Right. So we need to edit that here. Okay, ah. I seen that, eh? Okay, I heard that. Well, I heard that, but then I thought. Yeah, it gone off. Right, anyway, so. Um, so it was in the, in, the, in the studio. I'm desperate for habits to win, but I'm going to be professional. Fringe is a better team, I'll say it. Uh, but I've not hide the fact that I want, you know, no. that's my team. I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you a wee story about what happened afterwards, right? Uh, and it's something I've never done before, never done since. See, when you finish, you, you're usually all the fans have mostly gone. We do an extra half hour or 45 minutes after the game, hang about a bit, and then you go, most of the fans have gone, right? And you go in the car park and you jump in your car and go away. I didn't this time. As soon as it was finished, I get out and just walk through the Hibs fans. I wanted to feel what was happening. And I was walking past men that were much older than me, who were in tears. And I was walking past people who had waited decade after decade after decade. And the happiness that i seen that day was just so beautiful. Now, having been a fan of Celtic as a kid, I'd seen I'd been at many cup finals and watched my team and I'd loved it. I'd seen them win the league. I'd seen, I'd seen Celtic win the league at Easter Road. Um, I saw Celtic win Scottish Cup and it was a 6-3 and a 6-1 against Hibs at Hamden. I've had lots of these for that side. Uh, my team, Chelsea, down six, I've seen this winning the Champions League. But that moment, that's the best. That's the best. Yeah, as a fan, I've never felt anything like it. So I, that's what I would say. I was in the studio and yeah, I was delighted. But I wanted to be out with the fans. <laughs> So I'm not really good. I've got a good one, mate, but I actually wanted to be with the fans at that point in time. I was able to go out and I was able to celebrate with them afterwards and that was brilliant. Well, it was just an unreal... The way the way we won it as well. I oh, know, last minute, it's, you know, and I was right down, right by the corner, I was right over the corner fly, your studio was right in the corner fly, where we took the corner and it went in. So we're right beside it. Fortunately, I wasn't doing commentary. Because I'd have been, yeah! <laughs> so I was doing that in the studio. But when they come back to us in the studio after the game, then we talk about it. Uh, and it's a shame, though, because I had to say, talk a wee bit about you know, the pitch invasion and the rest of it. But it was secondary. We waited a long time, and it was a glorious day. And, and any, any Hibs fans mind. And then the moment comes where you sing Sunshine and Leith, and it was just, it was just fabulous. Did you <laughs> sing it? Aye, obviously. What, in the studio? <laughs> oh, aye. And um, I'll tell you a quick wee story because I only get ahead in about 10 minutes, but I'll tell you a quick wee story about that. You remember uh, we beat Kilmarnock 5-1 in, yes. in the League Cup? I was doing the, the game there and in the studio I'd say to him, we have to win here, I'm not talking over Sunshine and Leith. And they said, oh no, you need to, you need to, and I said, because in those days it, it wasn't a known thing through all the, you know, they didn't know how big a thing it was. I said, I'm not talking about it. Anyway. Comes, we get the trophy left, the lads go down, John Collins is on the pitch. And I can just hear the strains of sunshine and we start him. And uh, Dougie Donnelly, who's doing the presentation, he starts asking me a question, I'm going, not speaking. <laughs> and he can't even talk to me now, he's nobody else to talk to. So he said, let's go outside and have a look. So the, the director's going mad. We go outside and of course we see this brilliant sunshine and leaf and everybody's singing. It was, it was TV magic. It was Hibs magic. But you'd never have heard it if I wouldn't have said, I'm not talking. So that moment, if you ever go online and look at it, the reason why you're seeing it is because I said, I'm not speaking. <laughs> and most people in the telly want to speak all the time, they want to be on all the time. The last thing I wanted to be was my voice in the telly so we could hear that, you know? No, but it's been a delight to interview you, Pat. If you're new, folk, please subscribe, please give it a like. Please comment down below and thank you, Pat. It's been an absolute pleasure. An absolute pleasure. You too. Yes. I'll go and switch it off. Right, I hope it's all taped. Do you know what? I'm going to tell you something. Keep it happy. Right. Right. No problem. I'll live near enough. Press the same button. No, it's the wee... Camera one? Yeah.